to gather the professionals and the experts in the field of this group of related syndromes to spread the word and the message about the grouping of the syndromes, the therapeutics and the research that is currently happening. I think as a parent, more parents need to come on board with, they need to understand the syndrome, they need to know that there's someone out there to help them, I'm bringing all these specialists in today to go out there and to speak to all the other specialists, CFC and Noonan and Costello, because some of the people we've been speaking to out there after the conference, that is just what some of the medics are saying, how do we get each other to talk to each other, we have more, we have more conferences more days like this because it's just shown from speaking to the people out there what's a lot they've got from it and they want to bring themselves together so they can all discuss um, how they can help the related syndromes. Um, my name's Emma Burkett Wright, I'm a research training fellow at the University of Manchester and I'm based um, in the Department of Genetic Medicine at St Mary's Hospital here in Manchester. So the RASMAP kinase pathway was identified about 30 years ago as being a really important mediator of the development of cancer. And it's only in the last five to 10 years that we've started to understand it's actually crucially important for human development as well. And that's why changes in the genes that code for the proteins that participate in this pathway can cause a whole variety of developmental disorders that we know as the RASMAP kinase pathway disorders. We're thinking about about half a dozen distinct groups of conditions. Neurofibromatosis type 1, Legia syndrome that's closely related to neurofibromatosis type 1, Noonan syndrome, cardiofaciocutaneous syndrome which has very strong relationships to Noonan syndrome, and Costello syndrome. Um, we know that Costello syndrome is associated with a high risk of cancer, which is about a 15% risk in childhood, which is clearly very different to people in the general population. We know too that neurofibromatosis type 1 is associated with an increased risk of a whole range of cancers. For the other conditions, it's less clear, but whilst we think there might be a slight increase in risk compared to people without these conditions, um, we know that the, the risk isn't anything like as high as it is for people with Costello syndrome, for example. Um, we now know the genetic basis for the majority of people who present with what we recognise to be one of these disorders. And that's something that's changing quite fast, exactly how we find the gene changes. But it is something that your clinical geneticist or other doctors looking after you or your child will be able to advise you about. We know that there's a whole variety of different ways in which people with these conditions might um, grow up and might present to doctors, but we know that short stature is quite common. We know that having a normal or even sometimes a large head size is again something that the majority of people will have. There are often big babies and early feeding difficulties are very common indeed. So I'm Sue Hewson, I'm a consultant in genetics at the Neurofibromatosis Centre in Genetic Medicine at St Mary's Hospital in Manchester. The frequency of the different conditions are, uh, it varies from like NF1 and Noonan's that probably affect 1 in 2000 of the population, which is actually quite common for a genetic disease down to Costello syndrome where we know there are maybe only about 10 to 20 people alive in the UK at any one time. So for Noonan's and NF1 we're trying to encourage that at least one paediatrician in each area would take a lead and um, know about the conditions and particularly be tuned in to picking up the behaviour and learning problems. For the rarer conditions, it would never be that all medical care would be in one or two clinics, but there is a mechanism of funding called national commissioning, whereby we could put the rarest groups of the uh, rarest syndromes in the pathway together and perhaps have two specialist centres, one in the north and one in the south. And in fact, my colleague, Dr. Kerr, who sadly couldn't be here today, is working with the Clinical Genetics Society, our professional body, and the National Commissioners, and Professor Patton, who spoke at the meeting, to develop this possibility further. But I think what's been really important about the pathway coming together 
is that if research in one condition gives clues to pathogenesis of a problem, it might translate into others. So um, the best example, I think, is in learning and behaviour. And um, in neurofibromatosis type 1, they're already on doing drug trials looking at a particular form of statin that crosses the blood-brain barrier. So the statins we've obviously all heard about because of the fats in our body. But um, if you're an NF1 mouse and you're given a statin, your um, ability to perform tests of memory and, and behaviour in the lab improve. And so there are now two big clinical trials going on, one in the Netherlands and one in Australia and the US, to see if statins work. As a preliminary, we have funding to look at the same set of psychological tests they're using as outcomes in the American and Australian trial in all the different syndromes to see how the results compare and contrast. And I think from the research viewpoint what's exciting is that it's now not just isolated rare conditions but what we're finding in one condition we always need to look will it translate into the other. I'm Erik Legius, I'm a clinical geneticist and I work at the University of Leuven in Belgium. Yes, um, these group of conditions result from specific mutations that occur in these genes. Now these mutations originate somewhere in the germ cells, in the sperm cells or in the egg cells. And you have to realize that these mutations are not so, let's say, unlogical because each parent transmits about 3 billion letters of genetic code to their children and there are always mistakes in these uh, genetic codes. But most of the time these mistakes don't matter. It's like reading a newspaper. You will not be able to find a newspaper without any spelling errors. But you know what the meaning is of a certain word or of a sentence. It's the same with the genetic code. There are always mistakes in the genetic code. And if you could compare the genetic code of parents and offspring, you will always find differences. But the specific point in these uh, children is that the, the mistakes that happened in their genetic code are at a critical position and change the function of very critical uh, genes that code for proteins and hence it has a specific effect that we can see. But the fact that mutations occur is in fact a natural process and it's the same in everyone. No, it is impossible to prevent this from happening and we will always have children that uh, will be born with somewhere a mistake in a genetic code at a critical position that will disturb part of their uh, functions or of some of the functions in their body. Uh, it has been very important to find these genes because they point to certain mechanisms in the cell, to certain pathways. Um, you have to consider these genes as um, uh, coding for proteins that one, help, one protein helps the other to get something done in the cell. So if one of these proteins doesn't function properly, then the whole chain of events is, is broken. We can now study this chain of events and this chain of proteins that help one, one helps the other in a very specific way. We can do that in cells that we culture in the lab. We can do that in animals, in flies, in mice, and we can actually see um, what functions in cells and in animals are disturbed and we can try to find molecules that correct these disturbances so that we can treat the symptoms that we see in these animals and then uh, hopefully one of these drugs that we can discover might in, in the long end also be very beneficial for, for the humans. Good morning, I'm uh, Mike, Professor Michael Patton. Uh, I'm Professor of Medical Genetics at uh, St. George's University of London. Uh, I've been involved in research into Noonan syndrome for about 25 years. Uh, when I started, we knew very little about the condition other than on the 
uh, cardiac side and I did a lot of the work looking at the clinical manifestations of the condition uh, and then we got involved in looking for the gene uh, and we found one gene and of course now we've got four genes. It's been a very exciting journey uh, and we know it's not a journey that's over. Uh, there are other genes to find and of course the real excitement is that this is just one of a number of conditions in the RAS MAPK pathway uh, and I would like to wish the other researchers involved in the field all the best for the future. A lot of the parents that we know feel very, very isolated because they don't have a good understanding of the child's condition and they believe that the future is pretty bleak and that there's no help for them. So an event like this will help them to understand that there's a huge amount of science and research happening and there is a lot of help either now or in the future and that they're not alone, that the doctors, the scientists are all working together to get a better understanding of what the children are going through and what they're going through.